thank you all for coming out and for being here, and thanks to you all for having me. And it's been a real honor to work on this project and be part of uh, working with everyone at MoCA GA. Everyone's been fantastic, and uh, it's my first show in Atlanta, which feels really exciting. Um, I'm pretty new here um, for the, about three years, I guess, pretty new, but most of it's been pandemic time, so it, it feels like a real nice entrance into the city. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I um, really, for the last decade, have been making a lot of work that sort of intersects the world of art and science. Um, I grew up uh, around the Chicagoland area near a place called Fermilab, and Fermilab um, had one of the, the only particle accelerators in the United States of America. So they, what they were doing there is they were recreating the moment after the Big Bang over and over and over again to understand how the universe works, to find particles. Um, so I grew up kind of with an interest in physics, and when I got into graduate school, I kind of explored that further. Can you all hear me okay? Should I get the microphone, or is, is this okay? It's fine. Okay, cool. Um, well, if that changes, please let me know. Um, yeah, so I, uh, in graduate school, I got interested in uh, Fermilab, like I said. I, I started working at different laboratories around the world, CERN um, Laboratory uh, near Geneva, Switzerland, which also had, has Large Hadron Collider, the largest machine ever made by man. Um, started working at Sanford Laboratory um, out in South Dakota, where they're looking for dark matter. I became a, an artist in residence at Argonne National Laboratory in Chicago. Where I was actually able to make work there using their apparatuses. And in 2013, I, like a lot of people out of graduate school, I was looking for applying to sort of everything, looking for the next steps, and I found an advertisement for something called the Anthropocene Curriculum Project. And I didn't know what Anthropocene meant, and I looked it up and I was interested and I applied and I got in. And that like small event sort of changed the course of really my life and my work and my research. Um, and what it was, and still is, is a, a project really funded by the German government that um, kind of helps many people, from many, different, many researchers and scholars from different disciplines, all disciplines, so mathematicians, scientists, lawyers, writers, artists, etc into cross-disciplinary conversations about the Anthropocene. Now, has anyone, has, people, has, anyone, has anyone heard that term, the Anthropocene, before? So just to like, I know it's a pretty, it's kind of a buzzword at this point, um, but just to kind of talk about it the way that I'm thinking about it, it's a geologic term, right? And we're actually, I, I was on a call earlier today, I'm working very closely with the Anthropocene working group um, who are deciding on the, on the origin point of the Anthropocene. Now. We're technically in an epoch called the Holocene. Uh, that's been the, about 12,000 years, the last 12,000 years we're in the Holocene. And the idea of the Anthropocene is they want to change the name of the time period we're in now because of human impact, right? We have been a geologic force. We have been like an ice age, right? We have a permanent record in the core of the earth, right? And that's, that's kind of an overarching kind of generic description of the Anthropocene. People are using this term in many different ways, and it's great, but, but at its origin, it's a geologic term. Right, thinking about deep time and thinking about an uh, origin point where the Anthropocene begins. The Anthropocene at this point is still a hypothesis, it's not, act, it's not an actualized thing. And that's why we're starting over here. Um, so what this is, is as I was telling you, I've, I've been working kind of closely with this project for a while. Uh, the Anthropocene Working Group is a, a group of geologists who are putting forward different core samples from around the world. There's 12 different core samples, and what they have to find is a golden spike. They have to find a starting point for this new epoch. It has to have a place and a time. And one of the top contenders is near Stanford University in California um, at a, a reserve called Jasper Ridge um, in a lake called Searsville, Le Searsville Lake. And what I did is I traveled out there. I got invited to go out there in January. Um, to photograph their core sample. Now this is just the top part of the core sample, and this is the, 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 the kind of most recent sample, right? This is contemporary times, so this is our like, life, actually. And what they can analyze in this, and we'll look at this in another sample in a minute, they can find so much information from this sample about how we've lived, how we exist. It's sort of a mirror of civilization, right? Um, and it's, you know, within this exhibition, what I have, the two kinds of work, there are markers, and there are futures, right? And this, this is kind of a marker, kind of to help us understand where we are and what we've done to the earth and the evidence that they found. Now when they're looking for these, what they're looking for in, the, in these samples is a global signal, right? They're looking for something that affected the entire earth in the same way at one time, 
right? And it's most likely radionuclides, right, from the, fir the first nuclear bombings and all the nuclear testing that was done in the 40s through the 60s, really. Um, yeah, so if we want to, any questions about this so far? I know, sorry, it's, I apologize for all the scientific jargon. I'll try to not uh, bore everyone to death, but uh, there's a lot of science to sort of enter this work. Um, let's walk it's this piece. Feel free, to, feel free to come and check it out. Um, this is a, a piece called Markers, um, and it, it sort of is a um, compression of many of the different kinds of markers we're thinking about within this exhibition, right? Because they're what the way that the, again what they're looking for in the Anthropocene are different markers to mark the way that humans have impacted civilization. So, for a long time, I've been recording invisible radiation from nuclear experiments um, in many different kind of site-specific experimental ways, right? So what I, what I mean by site-specific experimental methods is that when I, try, when I decide to document something, instead of going about it using a camera or something, maybe I will use a camera, but I d devise a site-specific method, a site-specific spe apparatus to document said thing. And this came into play when I was living in Chicago um, the world's first nuclear reactor took, actually, ha reaction happened at University of Chicago in the 40s. And after that reaction happened, they moved it to a forest preserve 35 miles from Chicago and buried it underground. I started to think about um, that place when I was, uh, about 10 years ago, I started to get interested in this material. And I went out there trying to document it, and it was just a field with a bike path through it, right? So I was taking pictures of a field, it was very unsatisfying. And I began to research it, and what I realized is that the workers on this project were wearing badges of photographic film. And this photographic film was showing how, this is their dosimeter, this showed how much exposure they were getting to radiation. It was a very crude method. Uh, and the, the way they would go about it is they would develop the film, and if they could read the newspaper through the film, you were okay. And if it was too fogged to read the newspaper, you were not okay. It's very clear what happens if you're not unclear, what happens if you're not okay, too. There's really no method, there's no kind of procedure. Um, so this became very interesting to me. So I started burying film in this forest preserve, um, and unexposed film, never exposed to any light, unearthing it, developing it, and I got amazing images, colors, very abstract fields, but the beta particles from the, the, the reactor were, were kind of interacting with the film and making something happen. So I, I, I use this introduction because um, the background image here that we're seeing is film that I purchased that expired in 1963. It was never opened, it was never exposed to any light, I just developed it. I had to really explain a lot of why I wanted to develop a film that was never exposed. Um, but, uh, so I developed and this is the image that formed, and the reason that I'm doing this is because this is another marker, right, of thinking about this is the, the evidence of human interaction, right, with the earth of kind of the bombing uh, and the nuclear testing that happened, it raised background radiation to a peak level in 1963 across the entire earth, right? So this, la this background image here is a marker in that way of thinking about radionuclei and radiation and making that invisible thing visible. The video you're seeing in the foreground is where that, that core sample was taken from at Searsville Lake, right? So this is the reservoir. Um, this reservoir is really unique because um, it was made with, a, it's a human-made dam that was created in 1892, right? So it's, that's another sort of like level of the Anthropocene. Um, it's, 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 because it's a dam, it has stopped sediment, right? So there's all this undisturbed sediment that's been collecting in this lake, in this dam for a very long time, and that's why they think it's a really good place to take a core sample from that could be the golden spike that declares a new epoch. Um, and sediment cores, as we were talking about before, you know, they could see evidence of earthquakes, chemical residues, nuclear testing, fossil fuel combustion. Um, they signify how we've manipulated the world. Um, and the core that we're seeing is, is 127 years of time, is what, we're, what, what it's showing us. Also, in this installation, um, on top there is a passenger pigeon. Um, and it's something I'm also really interested in. I don't know if you guys know that much about the passenger pigeon. Um, and they're kind of actually placed throughout the exhibition in a few different ways. I'll show you the rest of them in a little bit. But um, with the passenger pigeon, I'm just looking at my notes so I don't get anything wrong with all these details. Um, it's a species that declined from billions to none in a period of 50 years, 
right? There were so many of them, when they would fly over, it would be a cloud, it would, the sky would go dark, and we killed them all. <laughs> um, it was one of the most populous bird species on the planet ever, right? Um, and the, the main reasons for extinction were hunting, um, loss of habitat, you know, through different logging uh, operations, etc. Um, the last one died in 1914. His name was Martha at the Cincinnati Zoo. And the last one to be shot in the wild was in 1901. Um, but they also offer this really interesting um, kind of place in this exhibition for me between the past and the present because as you know, we're thinking about the future as well, there's a major de-extinction effort happening with the passenger pigeon. So they are trying to use DNA from the passenger pigeon and crossbreed it with the rock pigeon to reintroduce the passenger pigeon into the wild, right? It's one of the first like major de-extinction efforts happening. So again, this kind of like problematic engineered future to try to create the history to undo human action, right? And that's a lot of what we're talking about here. Any questions? So what we're seeing here um, in the species is called at the core of the core of the core. Um, and the material list I think is interesting, so I'll read it. Um, archival pigma print of CT scan of core sample extracted from Searsville Lake, airplane tray table, sulfur, aqua resin, dirt extracted from the site of the world's first nuclear reactor, asphalt, rubber mulch, and reflective corn. This is the entirety of the core sample. Um, so stemming 127 years. It's not to scale, it's a little smaller than scale. Um, it's a, you know, at scale it would be about six feet longer or something like that. Um, and the idea of this piece was to sort of uh, form an aesthetic representation to, of, of what's sort of happening, what's represented in this core sample, right? To kind of um, form other entry points into thinking about our history and our impact on the earth. Um, so again, the, the radioactive dirt, don't worry, it's not like dangerously radioactive or anything like that, um, you know, being a, a signal. And within, within, you know, this, as you look through this, all these markings, these purple markings mark different years, and they can find so much. They can be like, okay, here's 1937. We can tell through what we're looking at here that they use copper sulfate to kill the algae in the lake. Right? This, is, this is a mirror of our civilization. It tells us how we've behaved in the past. It helps us understand how we will behave in the future. They can tell earthquakes, so many different things they can find from this. Because it's very interesting evidence. I was just at, in Berlin at a, at a conference about all these cores where all the scientists were presenting theirs because it's, you know, this is like, we'll change the way we think about our world, right? This is a pretty big deal. Um, so that's kind of the idea behind this piece. Um, the tray table, um, and you see a lot of airplane parts throughout this exhibition. Um, and I'm thinking a lot about, you know, the global world we're living in, globalization and planetarity, um, and, you know, how impossible it sort of is, right? And it's that, not in a finger pointy kind of way, as I just said, I've been flying around a lot, like a lot of people have, um, but in a way that's really, it's, it's more of a question of like, can our planet withstand this sort of, this travel? And, if, and when you look to, I think I'm really interested in like, in all my work of looking at the core of something, right? Like if you really look at something, what, what, what is the cause behind a lot of issues that we're having? During the pandemic, I became very interested in um, how during lockdown, the earth was vibrating less, right? Because we were moving less, you know? And that, it was really, really a very interesting that that ge thing that geologists were, were uh, monitoring and, and, and and learning about, um, and it, you know, it's a short period of time actually, so it was kind of hard just to like measure the environmental impact of that, but it certainly was not bad, it was a better thing for the environment, people weren't driving as much, people were not flying as much. Um, so kind of thinking about that and, 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 you know, how that changed the world and changes how we think about the world, and with Zoom and all these different kind of initiatives of how it changes the way we travel and communicate perhaps, but um, I think if you look at, you know, human interaction with the earth, and how things have sort of, you know, we've hit some tipping points. Um, this is kind of an interesting time to, to be showing this exhibition as we're in major, major heat waves, you know, around the United States. Um, and if you look at what's at the core of those tipping points, you see, you know, a lot of industrial movement. You see airplanes, you see cars, you see, you know, petroleum, things like that, um, that, that kind of have 
had a major impact on our earth and how we, how we, the air we breathe, all those kinds of things. And so, you know, the, these pieces were, that I've talked about so far were kind of the evidence, right, the markers that help us understand where we are, what we've done to the earth. And these, the rest of the works I'll talk about today are kind of simulations, speculative documents, I think is how we've referred to them. Um, I've, I've historically made really documentary work in the, in the last two years, I've kind of been experimenting with this, these kind of different procedures of trying to create an aesthetic, trying to, to, to visualize what our geoengineered future might look like. And for those unfamiliar with geoengineering, it's, it's simply, uh, it's been happening for a very long time, but these are um, initiatives to com often to combat climate change, right? Instead of changing behavior, there's a bunch of different methods that are proposed to help cool the earth, right? And the one that we're talking about here is solar radiation management. Um, and what's being proposed is to inject sulfur into the stratosphere. That's the, hence the name of the show, right? Um, to inject sulfur into the stratosphere using airplanes that fly around the earth kind of consistently because sulfur, there's other materials that would work too. Diamonds would actually work very well. It's a little expensive probably, um, but sulfur's cheap, right? And it reflects light really well. And it's really light, it floats, it's good aerosol. Um, so airplanes will fly around the earth spreading sulfur and that will cool down the earth. And they know this for a lot of reasons, um, mainly because what they're doing is mimicking volcanic eruptions, right? And the last major uh, volcanic eruption, major being a level seven, was 1815, the eruption of Mount Tambora in Indonesia. Um, and that was the, the year of no summer, is how it's referred to. So it, it snowed in Massachusetts in July. There was frost in Virginia in August. That ash from that volcanic eruption that included sulfur cooled the earth, the entire earth, actually for a few summers, right? Um, so they've used this kind of methodology they've been thinking about, so this is a way we could actually cool on the earth. And it's the only method that could instantly cool the earth, right? So there are many different things, carbon capture, I'm sure you've heard about a lot of these things. We could all stop driving like the entire earth. It would still take years to have an effect, but this could actually happen tomorrow. I'm not promoting this. Uh, this is just the fact, the fact of it. Um, I'm not saying it's a great idea because I think there are so many unknowns and so many problems with it. Um, so to make this work, uh, I took, it's pretty simple. I, I used photographic film, four by five, large format photographic film. I photographed the sky, the daytime sky, and then I covered it in sulfur and re-exposed it to kind of create an image of what it may look like with the sky. So some of the, the definite implications, side effects of this process would be the sky would probably not be blue anymore. The sky would be white or yellow or a different color would be hazy, right? At night, um, you would not see the stars very well anymore. Right, so it's, it's, to me it's like uh, very important with these geoengineering initiatives to raise some awareness about them because they are definitely, like I'm not a conspiracy theorist, I'm not, I don't think I'm crazy. I think this is actually like possible that it will happen, you know? Um, for all the things I just said, cause it's, it's very, it's just, it's a, it's a method that's cheap and if things get too hot, like I was just in Louisiana all last week, I'm working on a film there and man, holy crap, it was just like, on, you know, so hot, record highs, you know, like very hard to be outside, you know, and um, uh, we're seeing these kinds of trends happening, you know, um, so it's, um, and, and there are major people involved in these processes already. Uh, Bill Gates is investing in this. There's a lot, of, this is not like a, you know, there's major teams at Harvard and at Yale working on these processes. So it's something that definitely is like um, in progress. Um, and I really wanted to um, have these works be semi-transparent with the light going through them so you can kind of hang out in, the, in kind of the image made, um, almost like it's the sky that you're involved with, right? So we have, it, it's kind of a little like Easter egg, um, but each one has a passenger pigeon. Um, it's cast in sulfur actually. So I'm also highly interested in like how these materials become part of the earth systems as they're introduced. Right? And the passenger pigeons are on pieces of asphalt. Asphalt is uh, really prevalent in this exhibition. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to the, to the leaf blower um, pieces. Um, Mark, I, have, I have a question about passenger pigeons. I was under the impression that they were a lot larger. Is this to scale or is 
these are not to scale. These, these are a model. So this is like as close to scale as I can get with the model available, right? Which became they an. They were large. Version. They were large. They were like they were like a pigeon. You know, it's like a. Well, you've seen the the model. They're probably like, yeah. like that. You know. Um, yeah. Isn't that why they went extinct? Because people ate them. People ate them. Yeah. People hunted them. They're easy. They were like slow birds. They're easy to shoot. But okay. for this process, it was kind of interesting to me that. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, and <coughs> what became interesting was the fact that the best replica I could find was not to scale. Um, and kind of using that as a, the inaccessibility of something that's extinct, essentially, from a conceptual standpoint. Um, OK, so uh, the next pieces. Um, these are a series. This is the first, the first works I made for this exhibition when I was kind of conceiving it. They were the first things I, I kind of thought about. Um, and they're a series called Coral Shielding. Um, these are very hyperbolic in a lot of ways, um, taking a lot of leaps, but I think they're, they're meant to kind of ask questions and create sort of a presence um, and an engagement with an audience. Um, so there are, obviously we know that coral bleaching is happening for many different reasons. Um, on, on the earth, it's a major problem. It's, uh, this season is, is predicted to be the largest bleaching event uh, that's, that has happened so far. Um, there are methods uh, being proposed to shield them like to shield them with uh, tinting material, right? So um, within this, these pieces of cast coral, we have tinting material embedded uh, within them. So kind of thinking about these initiatives, these, uh, these geoengineering methods kind of collapsing into the actual things they're trying to protect. Um, there's also different procedures they've talked about with cooling them, so hence the air conditioning vents as well. Um, and again, looking at, uh, at things and trying to get to the core of, of of, of what we're looking at, um, you know, I think when you look at, to, at the core of coral bleaching, again, you see automobiles, right? And you see airplanes, right? So what we have here, all these are, are you know, found um, rims around Atlanta. It was, it's, I'm new here, like I said before, it was not very hard to find rims around um, <laughs> or any car parts. It's been really good for, for uh, the kind of work I want to make right now. Um, and then airplane parts, and what this is, right here is the, it's, it's called a personal service unit. Um, and it's, if you can't see, you can come around here, but it's, it's the air conditioning and lighting thing that's above you on an airplane. Um, this sort of this idea that we leisurely, in the airplane trade table too, we're kind of leisurely traveling around the world, drinking a cocktail and like a controlling our temperature. It's like a very luxurious thing that I don't think we necessarily understand the impact of all the time. Um, and then within, Yeah, we're gonna go. We'll go there. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then within uh, the the bottom parts here, the coral. This is also sulfur cast coral on um, the, the bottom level. So kind of thinking about that, and it's surrounded by volcanic ash. So at the bottom of all these is actual volcanic ash. Um, so kind of think about the influence of that, the cooling of that. All these materials, every choice, as you probably have noticed as I talked to this, everything has meaning, right? So like I, every kind of uh, material choice I make, I hope to like create a conversation to, to create like an aura with the elements kind of coming together, sort of an alchemy of sorts. Um, so just a couple more of these pieces that are doing the same kinds of things. That has a matching tray table to that, that piece over there. Uh, this also is a personal service unit. Um, but I wanted to bring attention to the corn um, because this is also another geoengineering method that is sort of hilarious um, of, of trying. And all these, I think, in the end, I think they're all like troubling and kind of funny because it's like let's not change our behavior let's let's put sulfur in the air you know there's all these things where it's like really this is the best we can do but it kind of seems like it's the best we can do you know it's like it's kind of like people get high blood pressure and it's like don't eat salt but they take a pill instead you know and it's like i'm not pointing fingers here but I'm just saying this is sort of how humans tend to operate let's let's take the pill let's have the you know the the remedy rather than changing behavior um, so there's, and, and this is also kind of a hyperbolic work. They're not trying to, they're not really proposing they make silver corn, but they're proposing making crops, modifying crops to make them shinier, uh, to reflect back the sun, uh, obviously to kind of cool the earth as well. Um, and uh, it actually would work, you know, it's a, it, as things, if, if you could modify things like that, there's so much land that's covered in, in agriculture that it would actually have an impact, right? And corn also being something that's such a large part of our existence, right? Um, and how we sustain ourselves. And then uh, I guess before we go to the leaf blowers, this piece here, um, 
which I cannot thank Eric enough for all the work he did installing this, um, is uh, I, I hope you all have a chance to lay down and experience it. I think it's really a fun experience, although it should be a little terrifying too. But what this is, is sulfur falling from the sky that I filmed. Um, and the idea, of the, again, these kind of silver reflective beds for you to lay on, camping mats with pillows. Um, but, but the idea is for you to, it's about a three minute loop, is to lay down and sort of experience this sort of new nature, this new natural. Um, that's kind of the idea behind a lot of this is like the new natural world, the kind of shaping, the terraforming, the, the um, re-making uh, of the earth, you know, through these different systems. And uh, sulfur, it would dissipate from the atmosphere, right? So it would become part of, of the earth as well. Any questions about anything I've got over the last few minutes? get ahead of it. I, um, <laughs> I try, I always feel like, I, I always feel like I'm such a drag um, <laughs> in the end. Um, how hopeful am I? Well, I don't know. Actually, when, the, when they came up with the COVID vaccine, it made me hopeful because, you know, a lot of the things I was talking about earlier with radiation and, and nuclear bombing, that was the Manhattan Project, right? And you had all the top scientists in the world working together and what became a very destructive initiative, you know? Um, but they were able to accomplish something. You just had this the, a vaccine created in like no time for a vaccine. Uh, that, because you had so many people working together to do it. So I am hopeful, but we're getting towards tipping points, you know? Um, and, you know, in places like India, places that are just getting so hot. Um, and, uh, you know, I think I'm, I'm semi-hopeful, but it's gonna have to, you know, I, I, it will only change if there's human behavioral change. You know, um, and um, that's, you know, I, I, every, pe people are much more aware of these issues than they've ever been. People believe in climate change now. It's a huge leap from 10 years ago. Um, for a second, it seemed like we were going to take action as a country on this. It doesn't seem like that's happening so much at the moment. Um, so I don't know. I'm, I'm semi hopeful. I think it takes everybody, you know, uh, kind of becoming part of it and, and hopefully things are done. But I'm, ho I'm more hopeful that we change behavior than have to, like, I mean, imagine no stars, you know, um, or imagine like a, not, no blue skies. I mean, you have to do what you have to do to survive. That's the thing. Um, but it would be a real, a real sad situation. Has anyone ever read Kim Stanley Robinson before? There's a book called Ministry of the Future. If you're into cli-fi, I don't really read a lot of cli-fi. Um, but it's, he, it's a really, if you're interested in this, it's a really good book because it's like, it's kind of predicted the future. It's kind of terrifying. Um, but there are many chapters about kind of, uh, countries having to use what I'm talking about here uh, to cool down. Um, that was an influence on this project. Elizabeth Colbert has a great book um, called Under a White Sky. It's also about different geoengineering methods that I think is also very much in conversation with this show. I came to this topic though um, for this show um, when I was making a film when I was up at Oak Ridge Laboratory. Um, and I, I, I met with some scientists there that were, they had, they had all these different methods for capturing carbon and working on these initiatives, but they had no money. It was during the Trump administration. All the Earth of Science stuff had been cut, and they were using, like, solar hot dog cookers and humidifiers to try to, like, patch together their experiments. They were just, like, broke, you know? And that's kind of where I got interested, I think, in these different initiatives that were happening. And now my leaf blowers. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so... These were the final pieces kind of made for the show. Um, and I, I thought they were kind of hilarious, uh, but also really poignant, um, much like leaf blowers are. They're a really divisive symbol. Um, as I'm sure all of you know, people have a lot of feelings about them, about the sound they make and what they do. Um, they're positioned on asphalt, I'll start with that. Because what I, I think I'm trying to talk about here is uh, you know, the over manicuring of, 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 of the world, you know, of, of the green law, the, the, the very pristine, green lawn. And I'm sure I've used a leaf blower before. I'm sure many of us had. So I'm, again, not trying to like necessarily point fingers um, at, at anything or anybody. Um, but they're very destructive, right? They're very bad for the environment, um, just as far as, a, as an apparatus. They also, uh, the manicuring of the environment is also bad for the different, for diversity, for biodiversity, for the different systems uh, that exist. Um, and, you know, I think they also, 
the sound pollution of them also is really just a, it's, it, it really is, is a hard thing for people to, to reckon with because there's always a sound thing happening. Uh, and, it, and it takes us away from nature, right? And it takes us, uh, it puts us in a place that we don't want to be, many people don't want to be. Um, but on top of pieces of asphalt, asphalt, and they have asphalt embedded in them as well as fake leaves. Um, so fake leaves, talking about this like ultra manicured world, also made of petroleum in the angst it's plastic. The asphalt um, is really interesting to me. It's, it appears in a lot of my work pre previously, it, it's also in a lot of this work, because asphalt is a petroleum byproduct, right? And um, so it's petroleum waste, but then we drive on it to create more waste. So it, it's, it's this kind of endless cycle that happens. Uh, and like, you know, these pristine views and these pristine lawns, there's a lot that happens to get that. Right? These roads you have to drive on, uh, these, the, the different ways people have manicured their gardens and landscaping. Um, and it's, it's something that you know, we have to think about. Salt Lake City right now, uh, the Great Lake, Great Salt Lake is drying up, right? And largely because people are capturing water for their homes, there's population growth uh, to water their lawns. You know? uh, things like that where it's like, man, I, these systems, they, they seem a little broken. Um, and uh, it just kind of makes you start to think about um, What's important? You know, what are our priorities here? Um, so, so yeah, a collection of leaf blowers um, for us to interact with, and I think they uh, sort of kind of and they kind of form a really uh, interesting end of the show. I think um, of kind of thinking about a relationship to these different machines, apparatuses that that help us kind of shape the world we live in. Yeah, I think I'll leave it there. Any any questions? I mean, kind of, yeah. I mean, Craftsman was uh, what I grew up thinking about as, like, you know, the, the thing. But that's exactly, Sears is bankrupt, and um, it, it seemed like a very appropriate um, symbol for uh, the, the culture of, that we live in. Yeah. I like the way you made them look like weapons. Yeah. What I was thinking, too, is, like, I wanted to be confrontational, like a line of cannons, right, that you're confronted with. Um, and uh, I'm really happy with how they, this turned out here. Again, Eric helped me a lot with the pedestals and uh, setting them up, and I'm really, um, really excited with how, how it turned out. But I, I, th I think they are confrontational. The, the, actually, the right here, I forgot to mention, is sulfur. So there's sulfur kind of that's either like coming in or coming out of them, um, but they, they, they are meant to be this confrontational apparatus. Any other questions? Positioned upwards, so I'm guessing just curious about that decision. Uh, pointing downwards instead of upstairs? Uh, upwards? Well, it's, I mean, honestly, it's sort of a practical decision of like, this is how they, they these are just sitting here. Uh, they're very heavy. Uh, this is the balance that could like sort of be achieved. You know, so I think uh, for me, it was just uh, how can we make these work? They're very heavy objects, they're very awkward. Um, but, you know, I mean, these end up being pointed at the ground as the way they're used, you know? So having at this height and pointing slightly downwards is, is sort of thinking about um, the actual use of the apparatus, you know? But I think at this height, they're hopefully still confrontational enough where you have an interaction with them that's perhaps violent in some way. <laughs> Tim's afraid. Yeah, I'm afraid. <laughs> Yeah. You know, the mansions, the plastic surgery, the, the lawns, the status symbols, are, it's just like crazy. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like we're just scratching the surface with recycling. I mean, recycling is like at Atlanta, I think it, 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 there's an 8% recycling rate of what you actually recycle. You know, most cities are like that, you know, but yeah. and sort of you, you to pay for these lifestyles, you end up with a yellow sky. You know, it's like that's, I think, sort of, I mean, it's not that direct, but it sort of is, you know, in a lot of ways. So, um, yeah, so I, I think considering our, our, our place in it is really important, you know, and, and yeah, we're all, you know, 
we're all implicated. Uh, they, that's the idea of the Anthropocene. Is like human. We we are now. We we are we are an ice age. You know, we've had that sort of impact. There's also um, I was curious because you kept mentioning like developing this uh, visual language on what you wanted to talk about, and there is so much materials here. So I'm like wondering, like maybe like the process of like discovering like what materials that propel this conversation that you wanted to have mm. versus others that maybe couldn't be as like successful or maybe like that. Like in between, like finding what was successful to... Yeah, totally. So I've, I've historically made fairly abstract work. Um, and for me, with this show and my, the last few years of working, uh, I've, you know, I wasn't really uh, a sculptor. You know, I came, I teach in the photography department, as you know. Um, and uh, I moved down here and I became very interested in making sculptural work. Uh, and the reason why was because I, these sort of familiar objects that we all have a relationship to contextualize the other work, right? We know what an airplane tray table looks like. We know leaf blower when we see this. And then we have an automatic association, right? A connotation with these different objects that sort of help, I think, the abstract work have a different sort of familiarity as well. You know, so kind of creating that tension between the, the really well known um, and the abstract. And then also with the materials uh, within these, you know, uh, those, the familiarity of those materials kind of creating a different sort of language of meaning within the objects as well. Yeah. Any other questions? I'll be hanging out for a little bit, so feel free to come chat with me, but thank you all so much for coming. It's been a pleasure.